little palate cleanser. <laughs> so Ludwig van Beethoven. We all know him. He was deaf, composer, grumpy, bad hair. What else do we know about him? I could, I could prove you wrong with, photo, with paintings, but um, most of what we know about him is the old, grumpy, angry, deaf Beethoven. Um, I'd like to rewind a little and talk about a younger, more ambitious Beethoven and his best friend in the world. Um, not quite this young. This is him at age 13. Um, he was born in Germany, 1770. Um, in 1792, he moved to Vienna, um, partly because his father was abusive, he drank and beat him, he was disappointed that young Beethoven wasn't quite as brilliant as young Mozart, and uh, Papa Mozart was making bank off of young Mozart. Um, but mostly he moved to Vienna because Vienna was where everything was happening. Vienna was for musicians, basically what Silicon Valley is for tech today. Um, everyone was there, the money was there. In Vienna, Beethoven made himself a reputation as a composer, uh, as a performer first, and only later a composer. Um, and he took on a lot of piano students, but he only ever took on one composition pupil. Um, for any Beethoven connoisseurs, you'll have recognized the Archduke Piano Trio. The Archduke is clearly named for an Archduke. This Archduke. Um, this is Archduke Rudolf of Austria, who was born 1788, so eight years after Beethoven. He was the youngest of the Austrian emperor's 16 children. 16. So, uh, basically we're looking at... Um, um, so there's a rule of thumb, you know, you have an heir and a spare, and... Um, 15 others, um, and to keep them out of trouble, generally you send them off to the military where they can make themselves useful. Now, um, a bunch of um, Rudolf's older brothers went this route and had quite a good career, um, but Rudolf was said to have a sensitive disposition, make of that what you will, um, and also um, a mild form of epilepsy ran in the family, so he had a, in trouble staying on horses, I gather. Um, <laughs> Instead, um, he developed a love for music and found a career in the church. So, by the time he was 15, he'd already had a reputation as quite a good pianist. Um, he was playing in concerts that Beethoven would have been attending. And in 1803, 1804, he started taking piano and composition lessons from Beethoven. Um, and he was quite good at this as well. So, while I was researching this talk, um, I was looking for stories, but I also found some music that he'd written. Um, Beethoven had set him an assignment, some variations on a tune that Beethoven wrote. <laughs> Rudolf wrote 40 variations. Um, they start quite simple and they get grander and grander and grander. And in front of them all, he set a grand introduction. It goes on for a bit, but, you know. <laughs> um, you, you, you can tell, you, you know, he's, he's learning from the master. Um, but they had a much closer relationship than just um, teacher and pupil or uh, patron and artist. Um, we know this from the many letters they exchanged. So um, it turns out one of the things that uh, Rudolf did was uh, as soon as he got rooms in, this, uh, in the royal palace of his own, um, he established a library in which he collected a lot of music, and also he collected all the letters that Beethoven ever sent him. Um, so we have all of those. About half of them um, are Beethoven making excuses for missing lessons. Um, <laughs> so they say things like this. Your Imperial Highness, I was much vexed not to receive your message to come to you till very late yesterday evening. 
Contrary to my usual custom, I did not go home at all in the afternoon, the fine weather having tempted me to spend the whole afternoon walking. In the meantime, I am ready at any hour or moment to place myself at your disposal. I therefore await your gracious commands. I am your Imperial Highness's most obedient, Ludwig van Beethoven. And for, and for those of you who laughed, incidentally, side note, completely irrelevant to this, um, those letters, Alexander Hamilton, Aaron Burr, and the jewel, all happened in 1804, right about the time Beethoven started teaching Rudolf as a pupil. So, lines up. Um, aside from the many excuses, um, many of the letters mention that Beethoven was giving two or three lessons a week, sometimes every day. Um, so, in theory, Beethoven was being a um, freelance musician, but um, in practice, he was clearly giving Rudolf a whole lot of his time. Um, the Archduke had Beethoven's back as well. Um, in 1808, the King of Westphalia offered Beethoven a job as Kapellmeister, as, as uh, head of the music at court. Um, Rudolf did some 19th century crowdfunding and uh, <laughs> got a couple of his prince friends together and they presented Beethoven with a contract guaranteeing him an income of 4,000 florins a year, which is incidentally enough to live off in Vienna at the time, on the condition that he stays in Vienna. Um, also, Beethoven spent a lot of time in Vienna fighting in court for custody of his nephew. He didn't get along with his uh, sister-in-law, and there was issues. Um, it went to court a lot, and Rudolf frequently offered royal support. So we have letters that say things like this. I really feel that I can never deserve your goodness towards me. I beg to offer my most respectful thanks for your Imperial Highness's gracious intervention in my affairs at Prague. I am again far from well, but a few days hence I will wait on your Imperial Highness. And then there's this letter. Which, which I'm not even going to tell a story, I'm just going to read it. <laughs> I hear that your Imperial Highness wishes to try the effect of my music even on the horses. We shall see whether its influence will cause the riders to throw some clever somersaults. I can't help laughing that your Imperial Highness is thinking of me on even such an occasion, for which I shall remain as long as I live, etc., etc., etc. P.S. P.S. The horse music that your Imperial Highness desires shall set off to you full gallop. <laughs> so that tune, which the European Union likes to use as its national anthem, even though they're not a nation, without the words, is actually a setting of the words of Schiller, who is shown here addressing a courtyard of the muses in a romanticized view of the Enlightenment. Beethoven was all about the Enlightenment. He was in it, he was a Republican, he was a fan of the French Revolution, he was all about the individual freedom, the power of reason, science, uh, liberté, égalité, fraternité, all the things that, you know. Yes. Um, but of course, the French Revolution ended with this guy. Now, when Napoleon crowned himself Emperor of the French, um, Beethoven saw this as a betrayal of the ideals of the revolution, and he's said to have exclaimed, so he is no more than a common mortal. Now he too will tread underfoot all the rights of man, indulge only his ambition. He will think himself superior to all men, become a tyrant. And he wasn't wrong. Napoleon marched, marched his armies all over Europe um, and in 1809 to Vienna. So this brings us to the most beautiful evidence of Beethoven and Rudolf's friendship of all, the piano sonata number 26, which we know as Les Adieux. On May 4th, 1809, with Vienna besieged by French forces, the entire Austrian royal family, including Rudolf, evacuated to Budapest. The sonata was written to commemorate this. Beethoven wrote the first movement as they were leaving, and his full title is in German, Das Lebewohl, The Farewell, Vienna, May 4th, 1809, on the departure of His Imperial Highness, the revered Archduke Rudolf.
So you, you can hear the horses and the horns of the carriage taking Rudolph away, as well as Beethoven's tears. Beethoven's publisher wasn't stupid. He figured that vague French titles sold better than specific German ones. And so he just shortened all of that title of Beethoven's to just Les Adieux. <laughs> uh, Beethoven had things to say about this. He wrote to his publisher, I have just received the farewell, etc., and must notice that there are copies with a French title. Why? <laughs> Les Bevol, farewell, is quite different from Les Adieux. It is spoken only to one person with the warmest affection, the other to a whole gathering, whole towns. Also, the farewell was not dedicated to the Archduke. Why not print the date, day, and year as I had written? In future, you will confirm to me in writing to keep unchanged all titles as I had written them. <laughs> While Rudolf was away, Beethoven composed very little music with the French canons outside Vienna. He stayed in the basement of his brother's house and covered his sensitive ears with pillows. To his publisher again, he wrote, My dear sir, you are mistaken if you believe me to be well. We have experienced fairly concentrated misery. I tell you that since the 4th of May, I have brought little coherent work into the world, only here and there a fragment. The entire sequence of events has had its effect on my body and soul. But he did write the second movement of the, uh, the sonata, The Absence, Aside from this, he mostly kept himself busy preparing lessons for Rudolf's return, um, copying out musical extracts and theoretical texts for him to analyze and study. He swore he would wait to compose the finale until Rudolf did return. He did at the end of January 1810. It's basically eight minutes of the two friends talking over each other in their eagerness to catch up. <laughs> Beethoven dedicated more works to Rudolf than to any other patron or friend. And when he dedicated the Archduke Trio, remember from earlier, um, he wrote, your name is mentioned on this work, but indeed all the works on which your name is not mentioned and which are of any value whatsoever are intended for your Imperial Highness. 
When Beethoven died in 1827, Archduke Rudolf copied out, word for word, all the obituary notices and memorial, memorial articles. And according to contemporary reports, though the elderly Beethoven was stone deaf to conversation, he could somehow always hear the Archduke's soft voice through the smallest of his ear trumpets. So on that note, I'd like to propose a toast. <laughs> to friends. <laughs> who, friends who not only accept our, and, but celebrate our eccentricities, who help us when we're in need, who lift us up to something better and greater than we were before, and most of all, whose return after an absence makes us feel Once more, thank you so much, Martin, for bringing this to the stage. That was amazing. How's that for a first time? All right, we are nearing the midpoint, so we're going to take a little break in a moment. I want to remind you that we're building an Adventure Harvey map. If you don't already have an Adventure Harvey, if you don't know what an Adventure Harvey is, find people over at the merch table. We'll introduce you to the pocket-sized Wolpertinger that has been traveling around the world, has been to all seven continents. You can get your own travel buddy over there. And we will be adding his adventures to our map if you hashtag them with Adventure Harvey on Instagram or Twitter or you send them to us in the Something Weird group. Uh, our map is growing. It's really impressive at this point, although uh, I do think we need some more Siberia. Uh, Central Africa, the lower parts of South America are sadly lacking, and also Greenland. So get on that, you guys. Um, while you're on the break, please take a moment to visit our merch table. Everything that you buy at the merch table helps us actually do this thing. Um, so please go and check out. We have new at the table. We have a postcard set of this year's beautiful artwork that was designed for us by uh, Imogen Spear. Um, we have a set of 10 over there. And tonight, for the very first time, limited edition, the grumpiest tartary lamb. <laughs> Uh, vegetable lamb of Tartary, a uh, legendary creature of myth and legend, now yours in a uh, grumpy side-eye lapel pin in limited quantities available over yonder. And we have, every night, a custom adventure Harvey. Tonight is our little eccentric Harvey made for us by um, Azolda Honore. All of them hand-stitched wings. Uh, you can get yours over there, and if you haven't already joined the raffle, put your name in the bucket. At the end of the break, we'll be giving one of those away. When we come back, we will have the story of the Lady Gaga of the Victorian Age, World War II, sword-swinging, bagpipe-playing badass, and the tale of the best, worst soprano. See you in a few. <laughs> <laughs> 